Hey folks, so this is my third video in my e-scouting series, and today we're gonna cover some unique topics. I don't think anybody else out there has covered them, and that's saying something given that it seems like there's a thousand e-scouting videos. First thing we're gonna cover is the private land dynamic when it comes to hunting these remote wilderness areas and these forest service areas. There's huge chunks of private land that borders these areas, and a lot of times those areas are refuging a ton of elk. I'm gonna show you how to hunt those borders effectively and get the information you need to be super efficient at it. The other thing I'm gonna cover is I'm gonna talk about the outfitter dynamic in these wilderness areas. I'll show you how to identify camps on mapping software and how to do your due diligence offline to figure out where those camps are, where that outfitting pressure is gonna be and use that to your advantage. In this video and the other two videos in this series, I'm using Onyx. The guys at Onyx have hooked me up with a discount code for you guys. I've put a link down in the description. You can click there and subscribe that way or you can just go to the Onyx website and use my code, it's CliffG and that'll give you 20% off on your subscription. Let's get into it guys. So first private land, let's dive into Onyx here. So this is just an example here on the edge of the flat tops. You've got a massive wilderness area back in here and then you've got all this private land that borders it. Generally what you're going to find if there's private land that borders these areas, nowadays they tend to hold elk year round and they hold a bunch more elk the minute archery season starts. So you'll literally see this the last week of August, first week of September, a lot of these ranches that are near the flat tops, a big influx of elk will show up on these places. And a lot of times they'll just raft up there in refuge. Backpacking into these areas that aren't necessarily way deep into the remote wilderness area, just the access stinks in them because there's not as much roads in there because there's literally huge blocks of private that are blocking the access into the wilderness area. So it's just a hassle. A backpack hunter literally has to bushwhack around, right? Right? Like to get in here, hypothetically, you have to come off this road, bushwhack all the way back in here. Maybe there's an access point here, but you'd have to bushwhack back in here if you wanted to hunt around the edge of this private. It's hard. It takes a lot of work. A lot of times there's not an established trail system that borders the private land, right? So it's hard to get back there and hunt those borders. I can tell you some of the best areas are these borders and they're not necessarily the most remote areas, but they do come with some downside. You can always lose an animal that goes over the fence after you've wounded it and now they're on private. It. That landowner in Colorado and in most places, I think, I think all the states in the U.S., that landowner has no obligation to let you go on there and recover the animal. Most do, but I personally know a bunch that don't also just because they have to deal with so many trespassing issues and they deal with a lot of conflict. They just have a policy of not allowing other people on their property. There's liability aspects. There's all sorts of reasons they won't do that. So that is a risk of doing this. So you can have a personal buffer, particularly if you're archery hunting, I would suggest this. Don't shoot elk right on the fence line. If they have an arrow in them and they're chasing a cow and they hop over the fence, now you've lost them. So if you're archery hunting, my suggestion is to have a little buffer. Rifle hunting, maybe a little less buffer, but just realize that that dynamic does exist. And it goes without saying, you have to have some sort of mapping software that shows you exactly where you are at all times. Fence lines are not always right up there, particularly in these remote areas. So keep that in mind and don't get yourself into trespassing issues or that sort of thing. Personally, if I'm doing an intense backpack trip, I'm gonna be bushwhacking, I'm gonna go in six or seven miles, lots of elevation grade up and down, I'm going to go hunt against some private land that refuges a bunch of elk. And because that border area near those refugee, refugee elk doesn't get hunted that much because it's hard to access, there's going to be some elk going in and, in and out. For me personally, I think that's where I can maximize my effort as a backpack hunter versus just going as deep as possible into a wilderness area. Some things that will extend the value there for you, figure out what the story with that ranch is. And that's super easy on Onyx to do. You just find the piece of property, click it. It's gonna give you some information about the ownership, potentially the name of the ranch, all of that. My first suggestion is to just go Google that ranch, right? A lot of times what'll happen, particularly if it's a big chunk, 
of property that's next to one of these areas. A lot of them do their own hunting operations and they'll advertise right there for hunts. They'll tell you the dates they hunt. They'll tell you the dates they change over because all that schedule is there. So you actually know when that ranch is getting hunted. The reason that's important is not all these ranches hunt the same seasons as you do as a public hunter. And that's because the bigger ranches, a lot of them that are next to these wilderness areas, they'll be in a ranching for wildlife program in Colorado or a similar type of program in other states. And a lot of times that allows them to hunt different dates. The reason this dynamic is important, if you've got a ranch that's running commercial hunts and they're abiding by the same season dates as you are as a public hunter, just your standard rifle and archery seasons in the state, then they're gonna be hunting at the same time you're gonna be hunting. And that means you can take advantage of that. They're gonna push elk off of that place. The public hunters are gonna push elk back on it. You're gonna be hunting the same dates. A lot of private land is managed in a way where they try to avoid kicking the elk off onto the public, but it's hard for them to do that because just like the public, when the hunting starts, there's gonna be more activity on that private land and there tends to be opportunity there. But if the ranch that you're looking at in that border area you're looking at is next to a ranch that's in a ranching for wildlife type program and they're not hunting the same dates as you, you could sit there all week during the, during the standard season dates and you may have no opportunity because there's literally gonna be no pressure on that ranch. A matter of fact, it's more likely all the public pressure is pushing more and more elk on there and they're per purposely gonna have very little activity there and obviously they're not hunting it because they they tend to hunt between the public land dates. You can call your local fish and game guys and they'll give you some information on that. All right, the last thing we're gonna talk about, my favorite topic, outfitters in the wilderness. Well, really not my favorite topic, but I've got a unique edge here because I was one for most of my adult life. The thing about outfitter camps is their hunting camps, typically you're gonna go in at the end of July throughout August, right? So if you're out there scouting on the ground, you're not gonna know they're there. And then what happens is you go in there to do your hunt and you realize that there's an outfitter camp where you were wanting to hunt. So it is, so it is helpful if you know where these camps are beforehand so you can plan accordingly. The first thing you can do is you can contact local forest service offices and see if they'll send you a map. Some will, some won't. They really should send you that information or at least tell you that information over the phone. The reality is they're stretched thin. It's not their primary priority. So you're probably not gonna get that information unless you really push for it or you get lucky. The second thing you can do is you can call outfitters in the area that you're gonna hunt in. I used to get a bunch of these type of calls. The reality is once the end of July hit, I was so busy, I rarely return those calls. I'll be completely honest. And I would guess that most outfitters are gonna give you the same reaction. Once they hit end of July, into August, they're putting in camps every other day, working their asses off. They're probably not gonna call you and talk to you about where their camps are just because they have so much else going on. Now, if you call in May or early June, you'll probably get a response. I used to always try to respond to people, tell them where my camps were so we could avoid mutual conflict and, and both have a better experience. I didn't have a problem sharing that sort of information. I wouldn't get into the details though, right? If people wanted to know the exact dates that I had hunts, Things are always changing, so I could never tell somebody, well, I'm not hunting this camp now, and then I am gonna hunt it then. You're not gonna get that level of detail from outfitters, so don't push to try to get that. If you did get it, it's probably not gonna be that reliable anyway. In most of the big wilderness areas, particularly the ones that are heavily pressured and there's a lot of tags, those elk are heavily dispersed, and over the years, outfitters have developed in those areas pretty heavy. What you're gonna find is a lot of the good camping spots are gonna be historical spots that outfitters use and a lot of times there's still permitted camps for outfitters. So there are gonna be outfitters in there. If all that fails, right, you can't get any information from anybody on the phone, the next thing to do is to use mapping software. We'll jump in on Onyx. I'll show you a couple tricks. It's gotten much easier to figure this out on Onyx because now they have a couple different sets of imagery. So you're much more likely to catch those camps when they're in. All right, so here it's obvious that there's a camp here, but I'll show you that just so you know what a 
of what a typical wilderness outfitter camp looks like. This is two wall tents here. This is a small kitchen tent and this is a bigger 16 by 20 sleeping tent. This is kind of what your average drop camp is going to look like in the wilderness that an outfitter puts in. The guided camps tend to be bigger. They're going to have three or four tents and there's going to be typically some mark of horses. There's going to be a pole where horses have been tied up to. There might even be a corral in there. So that'll be a telltale sign of an outfitter camp. This is what they look like. Here, it's nice because the standard, because the standard satellite imagery has the camp in. But if we click here and we look at recent imagery on Onyx, you're going to see that back July 10th, which was just a couple months ago, the camp wasn't in. This happens to be one of my old hunting camps, and I know it was only used during hunting season. I know the guys that still operate the business, that they are still using it just during hunting season, so they just hadn't put it in yet, right? So if you were looking at this and the imagery was from a month ago, from a month ago, you wouldn't have seen the camp. But I'll tell you a couple signs that you can use that there is an outfitter camp in there. One is if there's a bunch of logs, straight logs that are skinned, the branches are skinned off and they've been worked on and they're sitting in trees. Those are typically frames for wall tents and that's an outfitter's camp. There are some do-it-yourself packing horse guys that do the same thing, but but either, but either way, there's a likely chance that if you see that when you're in the woods scouting, when you go back in there in the fall, there's a decent chance there's going to be a wall tent camp in there if you're seeing those big long poles that are used to put wall tents up. If you see those stacked up in a tree, that's a, that's a pretty good sign. Another sign is the Forest Service does issue little signs, little laminated signs to outfitters at times, and they can post those up in the summer, just giving people a heads up. I used to try to do that when we were up cutting trail, just so people knew, people knew who were out scouting that, hey, there's gonna be a camp in here during the hunting season. It doesn't mean that they can't hunt there. It doesn't mean they can't camp there. People like to know that for planning purposes, so a lot of times you will see those signs, and they're up there to tell you. It tends to be Forest Service policy that outfitters camps are not right on the main trails, the main pack trails. They like them to be visually off those trails. So a lot of times going into these camps, you'll see fairly long spur trails, right? Or sometimes the Forest Service calls them social trails, but they'll be like a half mile up off the main trail. And then they'll stop near a really good water source. And that's something you'll see with outfitter camps. Historically, there's always been horses in those camps and pack mules in those camps. So water is key in those camp locations. So almost all outfitter camp locations are going to have a very good source of water. Not all of them. I had a couple camps that I used to pack water in, but for the most part, that's what they're going to look like. Spur road, off in a little private bench with, with a good water source. So if you see that, and particularly if that spur trail has a lot of erosion and it looks like horses have been huffing up it pretty hard, there's a good chance that there's an outfitter camp in there. That's just a telltale sign. So I'll show you another example of that here. This was actually a neighboring outfitter to me when I was operating. I know they have a camp right in this area. You can see here back between June 12th and June 26th, there was no camp in there. It was, it was a huge snow year this year, so I'm sure they couldn't get in there at that time but I do know that they use this camp for summer and hunting season. So if I go through the recent imagery on Onyx here, you can see right here, wall tents pop up in mid-July. So that makes sense. Once the snow melt melted out, they put their summer camp in. I happen to know that these are also camp, this camp is also hunted and it's going to be there. But, but that gives you an idea that you can use that recent imagery to see if a camp is put in there. And a matter of fact, as we get into archery season and this gets updated, there's always a decent chance that the update aligns with the imagery that you can actually see if they've already put a camp in for this hunting season. So that's super timely, useful information that you can get and you can plan around that. And if anything, even if it doesn't change your plans, at least you know that there's a camp there. And the way that you get to that other, other imagery is your main Onyx panel here. You just go here and then click recent imagery. Recent imagery, you'll take you to recent imagery. Here, it'll take you to the main imagery. The main imagery that's on here is higher resolution and just better, but that recent imagery gives you a lot of flexibility to see what's going on over time. 
All right, guys, so I tried to touch on some things that other guys out there haven't touched on in terms of this at-home scouting, due diligence, e-scouting, whatever you want to call it. I hope everything I covered was useful to you and you use it out there in the field this fall. If it was, do me a huge favor, like the video and subscribe to the channel. And like I said, if you want to get Onyx, use my code. It's Cliff G. Go to their website and use it or use the link below. I'm going to have a couple more e-scouting videos coming out. One's going to cover mule deer. Another one's going to cover picking a camp spot. Another one's going to dive deep into finding those glassing locations and getting to those top glassing locations regardless of the type of hunting you're doing. Good luck out there, guys. I'll catch you later.